it's a refrain I keep hearing among science fiction writers about themselves that they just feel that they're doing the real work and technically of fiction writing. I think Ray, Ray and I can both speak to this technically. If you're writing a good story that also has a good word craft and literary merit, that also invents a world that also is not incongruent with science as we know it. The technical challenge is very high in this kind of enterprise. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. But just yeah, a lot, a lot more, a lot more balls you have to keep in the air than yeah. you're doing your criminal stuff now. Making sure you're consistent with what you said 50 pages ago and your assumptions of how this world works. All, all, all those are, are issues science fiction writers face that, that someone writing in a more mainstream. One of my mentors is a uh, writer, Elizabeth Moon, she writes science fiction as well as fantasy. Um, the Speed of Dark is an amazing book about an autistic main character about maybe 40 years from now, so it's near future science fiction. And as Elizabeth wrote this book, every week you know, she read Nature and Science, Science and New Scientist, she was keeping up with brain research. She had to keep changing things all the way through because the science was so fast, she could barely keep it in. But the result was that it is grounded in pretty much modern neuroscience. It's the most amazing book because the reader's in the mind of this autistic character who is totally plausible and sympathetic and, you know, convincingly autistic. Her son is autistic. She knows very well what it's like. And the speed of dark won the Nebula Award, which was the science fiction community's highest accolade of writers bestowing on another writer. That's Elizabeth Moon, who is a uh, graduate of the University of Great. We should get her here to do something. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, oh, we have a question. Yeah. Uh, moving a little bit away from, say, science. Um, science fiction sometimes is used to explore ethics or society or morality and it seems that the science part is just used as an excuse to give the writer free range to say anything which is totally acceptable I guess but say like Star Trek The Next Generation or the new Battlestar Galactica says a lot of things about society and the way we are now and, and just things about morals and ethics could you say things Science is kind of thin on the ground. In yeah, exactly. The science seems almost like tacked on. It's, it's the stage to tell the story, I think. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it gives you the opportunity. I'm, I'm not on the panel, but I'm like, <laughs> 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 um, it's the kind of, you can tell stories that you can't tell any other way. So. One definition of science fiction is it arguably it's the only genre where the absolute, non negotiable starting point that something changed from the here and now that we know. And you can run the change as a thought experiment. You can change science. But you can also take you know, a lot of stuff over as window dressing and change the ethical makeup of you know, a society or a group of people. And then, you know, you can't, and some of the best, the worst, and all the science fiction in between, what's changed is human beings. A lot of science fiction comes up with a changed kind of human being. And that can open ethical questions uh, that never end. It's a very powerful ethical tool. But yeah, you're right, sometimes the science is window dressing. Well, sometimes that's, that's okay. But I think one, one advantage of science fiction is that one way it can be used for, or it can be used for social criticism in a way that other genres can't, because it slips past, it slips past the censors. Whether whether it's the censors or teachers and you know, uh, uh, ministers in, in our world, or, <laughs> and that's not the person, but or you know the the commissar in, in uh, Salinas, the Soviet Union. You know, the someone's going to pick up a book and just see. And, you know, if the censors pick it up. Oh, it's just juvenile trash. There's no nothing serious to be discussed here. So. Let the, let the you know let twelve year olds read that and they'll grow out of it and become you know, good little cogs in our whatever our social structure. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you can slip all sorts of subversive ideas into, into you know, oh. sensibly juvenile literature. That, that, 
And it's subversive ideas, yeah, whatever, whatever your society thinks is subversive, you, science fiction can get that, uh, get that across. Uh, you, you know, you can have, some, there's science fiction uh, that, that has all sorts of uh, you know, bizarre extrapolate or bizarre modifications of sex and gender roles. Mm -hmm. And then you can have the most you know, quasi-fascistic military SF. And that, you know, they can both travel under the same they're, they're both, you know, within the same pulpy covers with garish colors and spaceship. <laughs> okay. And the average, you know, the average censor is just not going to worry about. It. They're going to assume it's trash and just ignore it. And uh, you know, there's a chance for. Uh, I mean, what you know, story about me? The what turned me into a lifelong science fiction fan was the novel Childhood's End by Arthur oh Sutherland. So I read, you know, I was I was in sixth grade, <laughs> small town Missouri, you know, and, and there's all sorts of. You know, it's a little dated, of course, in, in terms of some of its. Uh, Social and, and uh, cultural portrayals, but it's you know the the, the it had you know, just the premise that there's you know there could be a world where people do get together and they would pass uh, they pass a lot of the the this illusions of you know, social barriers that are kind of illusionary uh, and can live harmoniously and uh, all all those sorts of things were just were, were powerful. Stuff that a, a story pitched to that, would be, you know, about the science fiction trappings wouldn't, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have picked it up because I wouldn't have been interested. But somebody, you know, the censors uh, of our world might have you know, been more, been less willing to uh, sell that uh, was it scholastic book order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I, I know that science fiction Alex, is sort of your, uh, your favorite book, Yes. Um, <laughs> there the, are basically two strands that you're talking about. You're talking about the the space opera, right? The you, you remove the science fiction aspects, and it's just a western, right? So, so I mean, it's just taking the story and putting it on another planet. Um, so the, the, that's one, and we tend to thumb our nose down at that. Even as we're thumb our nose down, what did I just say? All right. <laughs> <laughs> thumb our nose at it. Uh, what did All right. Um, so even as we're enjoying it, right? I mean, Star Wars. Come on, we we're all fans of Star Wars, at least the first ones. <laughs> so, there are only three. Yeah, yeah. But, oh, you just <laughs> missed the others. All right. So um, we're. We tend to look down on it even as we're enjoying it, but, but the other part that you're talking about is allegory. That that is what they're doing. They're basically, think of all the science fiction you read in high school, you were forced to read in high school. What were the novels? I wasn't forced to read it. I guess I didn't go to a great high school, I was forced to read science fiction. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know. Wrinkle in Time. Yes. Oh, Wrinkle in Time. Oh, Brave New World. Brave Brave New New World. World. Yeah, 1984. Or, uh, Fahrenheit 451. Right? These are the sense. novels. These are not novels about the science. These are allegories. Um, in the same way that the uh, Animal Farm, they're basically Animal Farm, right? Except, all right, it's not animals, it's real people, but they're in a different place, so it's the same thing. It's, you, you, you simply remove the setting instead of removing the characters or the, the people. So it's, it's really just trying to get at something uh, meaningful. Now, the, the more interesting part, and the part I work with, deals with the ethics of the science itself. Uh. Stuff like blood music um, is a great example. If you haven't read this, a, uh, um, a researcher loses his job because he's been doing experiments that are considered unethical, and he injects the experiments into himself in order to sneak them out of the company. So, I mean, it's got a lot of stuff about intellectual property. Um, and then even, you know, what happens to him from there. Uh, it can very easily become a zombie novel. So, the, you know, it, it's, it's not about the ethics or the political ramifications of just a person's choice. It's about the science itself, the ethics of science. Um, there's even, they're doing an